All righty, everybody. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad that so many of you could get on live. Um, I did realize when we booked this that I was competing with Colton, the current Bachelor's hometown visits. So <laughs> I appreciate everybody breaking from the, you know, low blow of reality TV to come learn about such an awesome topic. This one is near and dear to me. It's funny because it's something that when I first started in business in general, in life, I would say in general, I, I didn't like objections and um, I've learned to love them in every area of my life. So I'm super excited to, to train on questions and objections tonight. I want you to know that I'm going to share a lot of specific verbiage and I have all of it written down. So don't feel like you have to take a whole bunch of notes when I get to categories or, or the um, objection handling process and particularly the specific verbiage because I have that all written down in an outline that I'm going to share after this. So you guys can just sit back, relax, soak it all in and enjoy it. So first I'm going to start with a fun fact that you may or may not realize. As business owners, you are going to hear the word no <laughs> more times than you can Imagine more times than you can count as you grow your business and in all likelihood you will hear more no's than yeses Right and what we do with those no's has everything to do with our success And there's a few things to keep in mind as we walk through the actual process of objection Handling and the first one is this sometimes what we're dealing with is actually a question and not an objection at all so a lot of no's very simply stem from somebody not yet having enough information to make a solid yes decision. And we're going to talk about that more a little bit later. Another thing to keep in mind is that no means that yes is possible. And I know that might, might sound counterintuitive, but here's another interesting fact for you. Most people absolutely positively will not say yes to an idea without saying no first without saying no first. And now by a show of fingers or hands, how many times do you think the average person says no before they say yes? Some of you have heard this a lot of you, okay? Five. The average person says no five times before they say yes, and it's because decision-making is an emotional process. It's not an intellectual one. So that's one of the reasons that we talk so much in our industry about sharing your story because that appeals to emotions instead of that intellectual process. Now, quick question, and you can write this in the chat or unmute yourself and call it out. What do you think the most important variable is when it comes to developing the skill set of objection handling? The single most important variable in developing that skill set. Does anybody have a guess? Practice, said Cameron. That's a good one. Listening, listening. That's another good one. You know what, Letty? You got, you got to nail that one. Curiosity, build relationships, don't take it personal. All of that is so awesome. The number one most important variable to developing that skill set is to develop your own level of belief. When our belief is stronger than someone's doubt, we're in a great position to handle objections in the most authentic and compelling way, okay? And when you look at our particular business, the three areas of belief to really examine and develop over time are belief in your products, belief in your business, and belief in yourself. And we can have a whole different call about that, okay? But I will tell you this, if you are taking an honest stock of belief in those three areas and you feel like you need help in any of those areas, please talk to your sponsor or one of us, you know, one of the upline NMDs, because we can help guide you to the best ways to build, build belief in that area. I'm going to just throw out quickly three common objections that you might hear inside of your business so you can just see and think about how belief may either help or hinder your ability to handle that objection. Okay, belief in our products. First one, somebody might say they're expensive. And I'm going to tell you right now, if you think they're expensive, you're gonna have a really hard time building value for somebody else. I promise you, it's not gonna be easy if you think they're expensive. Belief in our business. Somebody may say to you somewhere along the line, like, oh my gosh, that sounds a lot like a pyramid scheme and I'm not gonna to touch one of those with 10 foot pole. And guess what? 
if there's any part of you that thinks what you're involved with is a pyramid, you're not going to possibly be able to effectively address that objection. Okay. And that last one, belief in yourself. What if your mom or your significant other or your best friend says something to the effect of, you know what, what makes this any different than all of the other things that you started and didn't do anything with? One of those people says something like that to you and you don't have belief in yourself, you're going to stop right then and there, dead in your tracks. On the contrary, if you do have belief in yourself, that same exact comment might fuel your fire to succeed. It might do the exact opposite of what it would do if you didn't have belief in yourself, okay? So right now, the first thing we're going to do is talk about the categories that objections fall into. Then I'm going to cover an overall objection handling process that, that applies kind of across all industries and all products. And then we're going to talk about very specific examples of the most common objections inside of our business, along with verbiage and ideas on how to address them. Okay. And at the end, what I'd like to do is open it up so we can workshop together any objections you've been hearing a lot. So as we're talking, if you can think of one or two that you've been hearing a lot that I don't talk about tonight, write it down so you can share it with the group at the end and we can work on it together. Okay. So across all industries, objections typically fall into five categories. Those five categories are need, price, features, time, and source. Okay? So for need, the objection there is that for some reason they just don't think that they need your product or service, or perhaps they think that they have a need that you can't satisfy. And what we might hear there is, I already eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I don't need this product. Okay? We're going to deep dive on that one. Price. They object to the price. And now immediately when we hear that, we think that the, a price objection would always be that the price is too high, right? Many times, yes, but not always. Sometimes people think the price of something is too low for the value that they perceive it to have. There have been times where I have been <laughs> making a decision between two different products that look very similar, one's more expensive, and literally in my mind, I think to myself, that one must be better. <laughs> Or it seems like a coffee maker should cost this and not $6. I'm not buying a $6 coffee maker, right? So, you know, that can go both ways as far as price. Feature. They object to some element or some feature of what you are sharing. Maybe it's how it's made or a specific ingredient or the labeling. Or in our case, the business model itself, right? If you're talking about the business. Um, we've already talked about need, price, feature. The next one is time. In this objection, they have a hang up on not being ready in some way, shape, or form. I've heard a handful of people say this year, you know what? We just signed up for the gym January 1st, and we just started Blue Apron or one of those healthy meal plans, so we, we just can't do any more changes right now, <laughs> right? I actually had somebody say to me, you know what? I just started eating vegan, so let me see how that goes first. They don't feel like now is the right time because they just went vegan. They want to see how that goes. Source. That's the final category of ob objection. In a source objection, they question the source of the product, the information, or its credibility. Okay? And I'm going to throw one out there that might happen in our business. Has anybody ever said to you, like, well, yeah, I looked at the research, but it was paid for by your company, so it's totally bogus. It's pointless. Okay? So by a show of hands, are most of your objections around need, price, feature, time, or source? You know? Because I've got eight years experience in this business, and I was hard-pressed to think of one that wasn't in one of those categories. I was like, you know what? They're right. That is totally applicable to what we do. Okay? So now that we've talked about the categories, what we're going to do is we're going to just do an overview of an objection handling process. And then we're going to see how that plays out with our common objections, okay? So objection handling, keep in mind, might take seconds. This whole process, this five-step process might take seconds. It, it, it might take days because it might be a couple different conversations. So understand that. But what, however long it takes, and no matter what the objection is, whether it happens quickly and seamlessly or it's during a series of conversations, it will typically go listen 
question, think, handle, check. I think it's pretty funny that the one um, I tend to skip the most of, of those is think. Like for some reason, I think I'm not allowed to take a minute to think, <laughs> which is ludicrous. We really need to be able to give ourselves pause when we're having an effective conversation. So we're gonna talk about those five and then go into um, a deep dive on our comments. Listening, when we hear an objection, and a lot of you said listening was one of the most important components, right, in honing this skill set. And it's the first step of the process. When we hear an objection, it is very important to not jump in at the beginning. And it's so hard to do because our belief is so strong. But if we interrupt them, we're objecting their objection, right? And if we don't listen, we're never, ever, ever going to get to a yes. One of the most important reasons to listen is because they're trying to tell us something that's actually going to help us get a yes out of them. They're handing us a gift, right? When they're starting to talk, they are handing us a gift that we can work with, with a huge bow on it. This, this, is, this is one thing I want to point out. Um, and I recognize this a lot over Zoom. If you're in person or if you're on Zoom, when you're listening, use active listening methods. Okay, I posted an article about this on Facebook the other day. Uh, it was all about these devices here and our kids and stuff. And one of the things, it was Simon Sinek, one of the things he said is, if somebody walks up to you and is like, hey, I have a question, and you're like, yeah, go ahead, shoot. Do you feel like they're the, that you're the most important person in the room? No, right? If they went like this, you know what? What's on your mind? If they sat that phone down, like it gives you a totally different vibe. So I think we need to be really cognizant when we're listening to be actively listening, to be nodding, to be physically showing interest, right? And I found a really interesting statistic. I, I was close to remembering the actual statistics, so I researched it to make sure I was right, and this blows my mind. You may have heard this 73855 rule of communication. But typically speaking, 55% of our total communication is delivered by body language. So I can tell who's bored right now. <laughs> it's not. 55% <laughs> of our total communication is body language. 38% is vocal signs, vocal intonation, rate of speech, inflection, that sort of thing. And about 7% is delivered by words. So think about that. We have to be really active listeners. And when we're engaged in that conversation, think about that. So after we listen, we're going to go into questioning. And I like the word curious better than questions, but be curious and ask questions. It not only shows that you're interested, but it gives you more information. And if you become curious about the no, you can continue the conversation and find out what it's going to take. Okay. And I'm going to give you a quick example wording wise of being curious because when I thought about that I was like you know what I want to give a verbiage example here of what might a question sound like of being curious so if I say to somebody are you ready to get your family started on juice plus and they say no <laughs> no <laughs> I'm not I might say okay but if I understand correctly though you are looking to make healthy changes in your family what exactly about the Juice Plus is it that isn't making sense for you? Because maybe I can help answer some of the questions that you have, right? And that's like a great way to just be curious. Like, okay, but if I do understand correctly, making healthy choices is, is extraordinarily important to your family. So what about this isn't making sense? That is what I mean by, by being curious. After we've asked some questions, some clarifying questions, some curiosity questions, the next step is to think, and it seems ridiculous that we have to add that into the equation, but we do. Before we dive in, we need to do a quick thought about, you know what, what's going to work best with this person? Is it, is it some more insight for me? And it might be. Is it a video? Is it a three-way call with someone on my team? Is it an event? My favorite thing to do is to, to tip the bucket, and I never knew it had a name until I started doing a little bit of research on this. This is literally my favorite thing to do. And my friend that was over here today and I were sitting outside talking about this. Tipping the bucket is asking for all outstanding objections. So if this is somebody I'm pretty close with, and I'll give you an example. I have a friend right now that I'm talking to about joining our team. 
And one of the things that, um, one of the things that I said to her was like, okay, do, do this for me. I want you to make a list of all of the reasons you can think of to say yes and all of the reasons you can think of to say no. And then let's just go to lunch or grab coffee and we'll just talk about them all. Right? I mean, that's a great way to have an honest conversation, right? Like just think of the reasons you would say yes or think of any, any reason that you're thinking about saying no. So tipping the bucket gives you the advantage of knowing their reasons not to buy, but it also shows that you're interested in them personally and that you want to solve the problems that they have. Taking some time to think is a good thing. It's adding a little bit of pause into the proceedings and it's demonstrating that you're taking their objection seriously. And I want to give you some verbiage here because sometimes people feel like if they can't answer an objection right on the fly, that they're not addressing it effectively. I completely disagree. I think sometimes adding some pause and some space can show that you're taking it really seriously. Again, this verbiage is in the outline, but one of the things you can say is, you know what, let me think about that concern and get back to you because clearly it's something that is very important to you. So I really want to get you the right information so that you make, can make a truly informed yes or no decision. Okay. And again, you switch that verbiage up to sound authentically you. Like my friend that was here today, one of the things I said to her that I just said to a friend of mine the other day, because this is something I would say to that friend who I know very well. I said, you know what? Let me get you more information on that. Because when you say yes, I want it to be like a hell yes. You know what I mean? <laughs> because that is how I would communicate with her. And she appreciated that. And I was like, I don't want it to just be like, yeah, I'll try it. I want it to be like, hell yes, I'm excited to try this. So let me get you some more information on that. So it's good to sometimes add that pause in and say you're going to get information. Another thing I sometimes say in the thinking stage, right, is I talk about my own journey. I say, you know what? I really like that you're skeptical because it means that you're taking this decision seriously. And I was probably more skeptical when I first heard about this than anyone you would ever know. I had a one-year-old, I was pregnant, you know, I was super skeptical, but I have to say, I also knew that my family needed really high quality nutrition every day because we have a really scary family history. So I did something I hadn't typically done in the past. I allowed myself to be skeptical and hopeful at the same time. I just allowed myself to do it. I was still skeptical when I started swallowing Juice Plus eight years ago. And I am so, so glad that I allowed myself to also be hope, hopeful because eight years later, my belief is stronger than anyone's doubt because it ended up being such a game changer for my family. You know, you can just be very honest with them. I love telling people, Look, I was still skeptical when I said yes. I was still skeptical for the first couple months I was swallowing it, but I was also hopeful, you know, because I know what the power of nutrition can be. So I was just, I allowed myself to be both simultaneously. And I am so glad that I did. So that might be in the thinking stage, something to add, you know, add in there. Handling. The handling stage, like I said, said after the Thinking stage might just be a few seconds or it might take some more time in the previous three stages. But when you're ready, you're going to use whatever method or verbiage that you believe will work best or you're going to make up your own. And the important thing to keep in mind is you're under no obligation to try to force fit any method or any verbiage of any sort. It's very important that you stay genuine. And we're going to talk through some specific handling verbiage to give you a starting place. And like I said, it's all written down in the outline that I put together. Um, so that you can just kind of think about those ideas and then say them in a way that feels natural to you. So after we've done all those things, after we have handled it, the last step in that process is check to see if it worked. I like to call this, this move to action. And in the outline I'm going to send you, there is a link to a YouTube video I made a couple years ago. It's about 20 minutes long and it focus, focuses exclusively on this step, on the moving to action step, right? It's really asking if you've answered all of their questions, if they're ready to move on. I'm going to give you two examples here of the type of thing I might say, but there are more examples in that video. One of the things I might say is, look, and I, and I say this because I talk about the research a lot, okay? Because that I, I just do. I love the research. But during that close or move to action phase, I like to say, look, I absolutely love, love, love that the research shows what's happening 
at the cellular level in everybody's body. But honestly, the only way to find out the full extent to which Juice Plus is going to affect your own family's body is to flood your body with it and see what happens. I really want you to use it consistently for a few months and write down any and all changes that you notice because feedback from people like you that I know and trust helps me help other people. Right? So I use that one a lot. Like, look, the research shows you what's happening in everybody. But that tip of the iceberg, the stuff that you might actually see and feel, that's going to be different for every person. The only way we're going to know how big those things are for you or for you to do it. And I want you to do it and write those things down. The other thing I typically say a lot during this part, and I just pulled it up on my phone and I can share it um, in our group. I just, it's our total satisfaction guarantee. I just pulled the actual clause off of our website and I put it into a pretty graphic that I email, that I just text message to my friends, and I will sometimes voice message this along with it. I'll just say, you know what? I don't know if I've told you this. I can't remember if I shared it or not, but one of my favorite things about our company is that they're like Nordstrom of the wellness industry. You are month to month from day one, but they also have a satisfaction guarantee. They offer an unconditional money back guarantee on your last shipment that was received any time in the last six months. So that means when I am sharing with people like you, I have the luxury of helping you see that there's nothing to lose and so much to gain. And if for any reason you can't establish the, ha the habit or you're not happy with it, I am more than happy to take care of the return for you. But more importantly, I'm excited to hear your feedback on any of the changes that you notice as you do this, right? So that's a great one to bring up with people as you're trying to move to action because our company is phenomenal about that. And again, there is a link here to more verbiage on that closing piece. So let's talk about specific verbiage inside of all five of those categories that we recalled. Before we get in there, I want to give you one thing to think about, and this might be one to write down. If you feel like you have one or two objections that come up consistently in your network of friends, you should consider diffusing that objection before it even comes up when you're sharing the product or when you're sharing the business. And they might be different for everybody because it might, it's probably going to depend on the typical population that you're, selling, that you're um, sharing inside of. I'm going to give you an example. When I am sharing this business opportunity with my friends in this season of life, right, one of the biggest reasons that I get for a no is that they are already spread very thin. They are way too busy to take anything else on, okay? So during the invitation process, I have started saying right up front, before they can even say that, I've started saying, look, I know you are crazy, crazy busy, but that is okay because so is everybody else who loves doing what I do. You know, like, well, what then? <laughs> you know, I have just started saying that almost every time I'm talking to one of my friends about this business because every friend I know is as busy as I am and it's crazy busy. So I say that right up front. And the other thing I say is, um, you know, people who, who say yes to this aren't looking for another job. They're not, they're looking for a community to be a part of, to help change people's lives. And you guys, that's true. Uh, these aren't lines. When I give you this verbiage, and I think y'all know this about me, these aren't lines that I say, this is how I actually feel, right? And, it, and it's how you all feel too. But it's important to think about these things before they come up. Because that way you're, you're prepared to really respond in an authentic and compassionate way. Okay? So if you have one that comes up over and over, consider diffusing it somewhere in your invitation or your product story or your business story. So remember those categories. Need, price, feature, time, and source. We're going to dig into each one of those categories now. Remember, they're on an outline, so you don't need to write anything down. And then we're going to open it up. And I want to hear any that I didn't cover so that we can workshop them. So number one, need. The need objection. So easy to come up with for our product. A no there. Oh, we don't need it. We already eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. Show of hands if you have ever heard that objection. Show of hands if you threw out that objection when somebody told you about Juice Plus. <laughs> Have you used that objection as well, right? Okay, so here's a couple things you can say. Somebody says, you know what, we already eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I like to respond with something like, 
you know what? That is so awesome. We do too. And it's honestly something I'm proud of. We typically shoot for a fruit and a vegetable at every single meal at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. My kids are over it, but they've also just come to expect it. How many servings a day do you guys typically get? It's a good question, right? Because what they think is enough is very likely nowhere close. Remember I just said we get a lot of fruit and a vegetable at breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? So if somebody is like, yeah, we do about that too. We try to get a fruit and veggie with, with every one too. And I'm like, that's really good. Because honestly, we are doing so many, much better than most people. We have, we should be really proud <laughs> because we know that that's not easy. But I got to tell you something. One of the things that blew my mind was a couple years ago, I went to hear an expert in prevention talk. And remember, I have a crazy family history. And he talked about just the sheer volume and variety required to impact prevention. And he started talking and he was like, you know what? Two servings is better than, than zero. And four is better than two. And six is better than four. But if you're looking to impact prevention and you're sedentary, you need to shoot for a minimum of seven to 13 servings every single day. And if you exercise, and every one of my family exercises, that we should double it. So that was like a serious aha moment for me. Because remember, we do a fruit and veggie at every single meal. That's six. And that's not even the minimum required for prevention for somebody who's sedentary. So that's why Juice Plus made so much sense to me. Because now all three of us swallow over 30 different kinds of raw, clean produce every morning before we even brush our teeth. Anything else we do is just a bonus. Are you open to watching a quick video about how the plant powders are made? Because honestly, somebody who values eating a lot of fruits and veggies like you do, I think would find it fascinating how they actually make it, right? So that is one, one thing I love to respond with, just kind of putting into perspective how many we actually need. And then I love sending the video about how it's made. You guys, that is one of the best videos in my opinion, because I like watching the process of how it's made and how it all gets in there. So that's a good way to combat the need. I'm going to go into price. When people are like, it's too cheap. I'm just kidding, guys. <laughs> I do feel that way, by the way. But when somebody says it's too expensive, first and foremost, I like to ask a clarifying question. And my friend who was over today and I just talked about this. I like to ask a question to figure out, and we actually talked about it on our leader call this morning too, to ask if they are actually talking about price or if they're talking about value, right? And sometimes I'll do that by asking people, okay, if they say it's too expensive, let me ask you a question now, because I just, I'm trying to see if you see value in even taking it. If it were half the price, or if it were free, if it showed up for free, would you take it then, right? Because I say to people, if you have, if you do see value in taking it, I, there are lots of things we can do to help with the price. I can give you an idea of how much I value Juice Plus. You could not pay me thousands of dollars a month to stop taking it. That's the value to me. The price I pay is $71.50, right? For Caitlin and I to take it together because she gets it for free. But the value to me is much, much more. So if you do see value in this nutrition, I can help you with the pricing options. There are several programs in place that can even help you get it, honestly, for free. Do you see value in being able to get this nutrition into your family every day? Right? So most of the time people are gonna say yes, that they do see value in it. And if they don't, then this is not their actual objection. Their objection is not the price. Their objection is they still don't see the value. Maybe they have an objection about how it's made or what's actually in it, okay? So then we, we know that we need to talk about something different. If it is price, there are a number of ways to handle the price objection, and I'm going to show you two or three right now because I think that one comes up a lot, okay? So if somebody says, you know what, I absolutely do see value in it, I do, we are just on a super tight budget right now, unfortunately. I like to respond with something like, and again, these are all written down, guys, um, you know what, I know exactly how you feel because we started Juice Plus right after I stopped working. <laughs> And we were on a really tight budget when we got started. I felt like the right place to put it was in our grocery budget. And we actually found that we saved money when we added Juice Plus. Can I tell you how we did it? Can I tell you exactly what we did? 
Typically, somebody's going to say, sure. And I will say, well, for one, we've replaced our multivitamin. So that, that was just a replacement cost to, to some extent. We got rid of our multivitamin because we didn't see a need. But I also personally committed to not throwing away any more produce. And when I was looking at that, I did a little bit of research and found out that the average family of four, which we are, throws away $1,200 a year in produce that they buy and then goes bad and they have to throw away. And we were no exception, right? Because I always bought what we wanted to eat, but not exactly what we were ultimately going to end up eating. We still eat more fruits and vegetables than most families that I know, but I do not waste anymore. We cut out a tremendous amount of waste out of our grocery bill between that and ditching the multivitamin. It more than covered the cost of juice plus for our, our entire family of four. Okay. So that's one thing you can say. Another one is to talk to somebody about budgeting. And I've had this discussion too. You could say something to the effect of, okay, when I'm budgeting, I like to think of this nutrition as an investment. Because yes, it's an expenditure, but there's a huge return on it. And let me give you an example. I have a good friend who was on the call tonight, by the way, because I saw her already. I have a good friend who kept track of her medical expenses the year before she started her family on Juice Plus. And then she kept track of her medical expenses out of pocket the year after she started her family on Juice Plus. And her out of pocket costs went down like, I want to say just over $2,500 that year. And I still have a screenshot of it somewhere in my phone because it made me so happy to be able to help her do that. Right? So that's a conversation you can have with somebody. Jenny, I know who you, Jenny, you know who you are. Maybe you can put the exact number in the comments at some point so everybody can see because that was really cool. Really cool. Um, okay. Another one is, and guys, feel free to unmute yourself or put in the comments. I'm not exaggerating when I say I, I like sometimes pray for the pricing objection to come up. <laughs> like, give, give it to me. Give it, throw me at it. Why? It's because I have a favorite way of handling the pricing objection. I like the other two. Yes, I do. And I, I use those two. But what is my absolutely favorite way to handle the pricing objection? Anybody want to take a guess by typing in the comments? Somebody can't afford it. Yes, 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 everybody. Offering the business. That's a great time to offer the business. And I might do it by saying this. You know what? One of the things I love the most about our company is that our founder is 100% committed to keeping this nutrition within reach for everyone, regardless of their financial situation. There's the buying option in place called the Healthy Living Program, which helps you offset or even cover the cost of your own products. I actually made a quick video about it a couple years ago because so, so many of my friends wanted to take advantage of the program. If I send it to you, would you watch it? Easy as that. And I have a link to it in there. And I clicked on the link earlier because I was curious and 8,000 people have watched it, guys. So obviously people are watching that video. Um, it'd be great if it were all people we knew, right? So it's a, it's a great way to share that as a buying option. So we've talked about some of those other buckets. Now let's move on to feature. What's a feature that people might might object. Hmm, let me see. Oh, it's not certified organic, is it? <laughs> That's not certified organic. Is it organic? It's not certified organic. So when somebody says to me, like, it's not certified organic, I like to say, correct. <laughs> correct. The company chose a different certification because certified organic just tests for herbicides and pesticides. And oftentimes it refers to only the growing process. So it allows for a ton of loopholes. Like some produce that is certified organically grown can still be sprayed after it's picked or in transit. So Juice Plus chose to go with a certification called NSF because that tests multiple stages in the process for not just what organic does, herbicides and pesticides, but it also tests for various other contaminants and bacteria and heavy metals. So Juice Plus is as clean, clean, clean as you can possibly get which is why I chose it for my family. Okay, does anybody want to go buy organic now? No. <laughs> I don't. I've learned too much about organic, guys. The, our, the certification we have and the things that we 
test for are so beyond anything we're putting in our bodies that we're buying anywhere else. It's amazing. So that was a feature of our product. Before I leave the feature category, I want to go on to a feature of our business that people might object to. Does anyone want to type in the comments a feature of our business? <laughs> there you go. Quick draw, McGraw, Cameron, MLM, right? People are like, oh, it sounds like a pyramid scheme. There's no way I'm doing one of those. It's a pyramid, okay? This is Sean's favorite line right here. I actually got this, I actually got this from my laundry folding husband. When somebody says that to him, he likes to go, you know what, it sounds like there's a good story there. It sounds like something happened to you. Tell me what happened, what was your experience, right? Because typically when somebody says that, sometimes that my uncle got involved with Amway or, you know, like there's something that's making them say that. So sometimes it's just good to ask them for what their experience has been. You know, obviously you don't, you have a sour taste about that, what makes you say that? Um, I like to say, you know what? I'm really glad you told me that because that was my biggest concern, to be honest. When I first heard, I, I was so intrigued and excited about the product that I was pumped to hear about the business. As soon as I heard grow a team, I thought pyramid. I thought the same exact thing, but I have to say, I also liked the idea of getting involved with something that was scalable. You know, that, that part of it was appealing to me. So my husband and I got on the phone with some of the people at our the corporate home office to really begin to understand the specific business model. And we were incredibly impressed. Can I share with you quickly some of what we learned? Most of the time people are gonna say yes. And then we go on to say, so the business model is really pretty unique. They call it a virtual franchise, but what it does is it takes the best attributes from several, several different kinds of more traditional business model. So like a franchise, you have that incredible branding and corporate office support, but without that typical high cost of entry and risk associated with a brick and mortar storefront that goes along with my, most franchises. And like a corporation, what they do is at the top level in the marketing plan, they give you a full benefits package that's better than any package I ever saw in my corporate days. And it is the only company that I know of where as an independent contractor, we can earn full corporate benefits packages, okay? And then it borrows the scalability opportunity from direct selling, from that approach. In that you, if you want to, if you choose to, you can grow and support a team of people to broaden your impact, which I love because that, that means I work for myself but not by myself. Does that make sense? And then people are kind of like, yeah. And then I'm like, so look, we started asking a lot of questions. We had like a checklist, like a litmus test for my husband and I. And one of the things we wanted to know with regards to the income plan was, does everyone have the same income earning potential? So we straight up asked, can we earn more than the people who got involved before us? And the answer was yes. You know, and to be honest, pyramids are actually illegal, which a lot of people don't know, but there are a lot of companies out there that have pay plans that are less than ideal for the people that are getting involved. So I always tell people to really, really do their research. I love that our company wants everybody to get to the top. Like I came from a corporate job and there were a ton of people on in the frontline sales force, right? A ton of us down here. And then above that, there were slightly less people in sales management and then slightly less that were vice presidents and fewer yet that were C-level. And then there was one dude sitting at the top, right? Like, have you ever worked for a company that had that structure? And most people are like, yeah, I have, right? And then I typically wrap that up by saying, look, we love that this is completely opposite. Everyone starts at the same place and they literally want everyone to make it to the top. Some people choose to do a little, some people choose to do a lot. Really the extent to which you get involved ultimately is going to depend on the amount of passion you find for inspiring others. Does that make sense? And then people are like, yeah, it does. And then again, right here is a good chance to say, I have a video that does a great job explaining the business model and what it could mean for you specifically. If I sent that to you, would you be opening to watch it? Would you be open to watching that? So there we go. We've covered need, price, feature, we're gonna move on to time. Time, somebody might say, you know what, I actually feel really great right now. 
Now, now's not a good time because I'm feeling good. <laughs> I'm flying high, right? Conversely, and by the way, I have had all three of these in the past two months said to me, one, hey, I'm feeling too good to do anything healthier. <laughs> Another one was, you know what? No, I, there's something wrong with me big time. And until we figure out what's going on, I just don't want to add something else new in. Okay, but people say it. And here's a doozy, right? So I'll take a look at that once I'm done my cancer treatment. Those are all time oriented. Sometimes it's because you feel good. Sometimes it's something wrong. You don't know what. And sometimes it's because something's wrong. You know what it is. And you want to wait till that is miraculously cleared up before you start to help yourself. Okay. So I'm going to give you a couple examples there. Somebody says they're feeling great. I like to say, that is awesome. And I honestly know exactly how you feel because luckily I was feeling really great too when our family started on Juice Plus eight years ago. But with my family history, I did not want to wait until I was sick with something before I got serious about staying healthy. Right? So there's that. And then if somebody is like, yeah, this is just, I don't know what's going on. They, it might be Lyme. It might be who knows, fibromyalgia, it might, be, it might be anything. We hear it all the time, right? I like to say to people, I love, love, love that this is foundational nutrition that can benefit anyone, womb to tomb. I once heard a doctor say that there is no human condition that can't potentially benefit from improving your nutrition. And when I heard that, I realized that it's one of those things where it is never too early and never too late to benefit from this kind of nutritional support. And I know that you've probably already tried a lot, but what if this was the last thing you ever needed to try because it helped to support healing? What if you never needed to even try anything else? Are you open to watching a video on how Juice Plus might impact some of the things you're currently struggling with? Because I would love to help you. Okay. Another one um, in that department. Actually, no, we're moving on to source. We've already covered need, price, feature, and time. I'm going to wrap up with source objections, okay? And this is going to be hard to hear, guys. All right, eh? It's a zinger. Sometimes the source they question or object to can be us, okay, for any number of reasons. And that is why it is so important. And it doesn't mean they don't like you guys. It might just mean they don't think you have the credentials or you haven't been involved very long or any litany of, of things, or they've known you since birth. And how can you possibly know about something that they don't know about? It doesn't mean they don't like you. It doesn't mean they don't love you. It just means that they have, you might be the source of that. Okay. That is why it's so important to connect the people you talk to, to a third party resource, like a video or a three-way call with somebody else or an event. Because remember, we are not the expert even if you are, even if you are. And I'm going to tell you right now, like, I feel like I know a heck of a lot about Juice Plus. I still don't like to do my messaging. I still want to invite and pass them on to a video, an event, or a three-way call with somebody else. And I know a lot. Even if you are the expert, you are just the resource connecting them to the expert, okay? We are not, we are not the message. We are the messenger. So it is really important to resist the temptation to, be, to begin presenting Juice Plus when the opportunity arises, and that will help you tremendously in overcoming source objections. Absolutely, if you can just practice doing that. Now, the final, the final objection that I'm going to walk through before I open up the phone um, is also source-related, and that's research. That is one that sometimes people say, I don't, I don't get this. And now, I want to make you a promise, guys, right now. If somebody is objecting to our research, that objection to our research will not come from people who know a lot about research. <laughs> it will not because they understand what gold standard research is. But there are a lot of people that don't know research. So they might say something like, yeah, I looked at the research, but it looks like your company actually had to fund some of it. So that's just bogus. Like, I don't believe any of it because you guys were involved in it. Has that raised your hand if you've ever heard that? You know, of course you had. And I like to say to people something to the effect of, oh my gosh, I actually had the same exact question when I started looking at the research and I looked at all of the research because I'm a prove it kind of girl. <laughs> it's just who I am. And one of the things that I learned is that research organizations and universities do not themselves have money to fund research, which I did not know. 
They do not have money to do that. So companies are always involved in, in studies. So the process when there is a research institution that wants to study the effect of Juice Plus on a certain aspect of the human body is we give that university a grant to fund the process, just like any company has to do if they want their product to be tested. And it is so critical to understand that the studies that we're engaging in are what's called gold standard independent studies. What that means is they're double blind, placebo based, and most importantly, when we say yes to a gold standard study, it's us as a company agreeing that the outcomes may be published, whatever they may be, good, bad, or indifferent, which is why a lot of companies don't want their products studied. Because when they engage in gold standard research, it means no matter what, it's getting published, okay? And the results of our studies have been so, so compelling. The company loves it when somebody wants to study our product. Can I tell you a fun fact real quick? And then people are like, sure, right? And then I say, Juice Plus is actually the most researched nutritional support product in the world because there are so many institutions interested in learning about how food affects health and healing in our genes. And can I tell you something that I learned that I never thought of? Sure. <laughs> I once heard somebody say that pharmaceuticals do things to the body and food does things for the body. And to date, there is not a single pharmaceutical or nutraceutical on the planet that's been proven to do for the body what Juice Plus has been proven to do. How cool is that? Okay. So that is a great way to handle that objection. Again, I don't, I love it when the research objection comes up because it, it opens up the door for me to talk about research and I love research. I think it is so, so important. I love the stories, don't get me wrong, but the studies you guys are insanely compelling, okay? Um, I'll also share with you, I posted on the Team Healthy Tomorrow's Facebook group today. If you guys wanna pull it down, I took all of our studies and I kind of put them into layman terms and I put it into just like a personal document that I, I sent to my friends considering Juice Plus. I'm like, look, here's a good overview of the research and it personalizes it because it's not just saying studies show, it's telling you what's, ha what's happened to Caitlin and Michael. And I'll give you an example, like the latest study on nutrigenomics talks about how there are 1600 documented changes in genes within four weeks of taking Juice Plus. So I could say that to someone and it's like, in one ear, out the other. Or I can say to them, you know what? My mom's had cancer twice. My dad has been on heart medication since he was 30. We have diabetes and stroke on both sides of my family. But when Caitlin and Michael started taking Juice Plus, within one month, within four weeks, 1,600 of their genes were changed. Healthy genes were promoted and bad genes were turned off among the thousands of other things that are happening in their bodies, I would take it for that alone, right? So that is like a really good, I like thinking about the research that way because I think too often we look at the research and it looks so clinical. You guys, that is proving what's happening in every single person that's on this phone and everyone we love who has said yes to taking our product. So it is so important that they understand that. So I know I just went off on a tangent, but since we close with research, if anybody wants to download, I just put it out there as words so you could edit it. If anybody wants to massage it and, you know, put your own family's names in there or your own personal experiences, feel free because I do think it's important for people to see that. So we have talked about multiple objections inside of need, price, feature, time, and source. We've gone through the objection handling process. I would love to open it up to see if anybody can think of any others. Um, that we can workshop as a group. You guys can see how quick I am on my feet or other people can jump on. Or if there's an objection you've gotten a lot that you handle really well, share that one too. I would, I would love to hear a couple before we wrap it up because I know the ones I mentioned weren't the only objections. I like to think they were probably some of the more common ones. Um, but who has another one? 